Good evening, friends, and welcome to our Maundy Thursday service. This is a somber service where we remember the Last Supper of Jesus, and we will have a tenebrae part of our service where we will light and extinguish candles as we read through the events of that final evening of Jesus. So we ask that you turn your hearts and your minds towards a somber place as we remember all that Jesus did as he died for us and rose again. And will you join with me in our call to worship? We enter this place of God quietly. Our hearts are quiet. We seek the presence of God. Our hearts are searching. We open our lives to God. Our hearts are open. We find the love of God. Our hearts are full. We have come to worship God. All glory and praise and honor are to God. At your table, Lord, we find strength. At your table, Lord, we find strength. At your table, Lord, we find strength. Oh, Lord, we find strength. Draw us near. I remember that night very clearly. It has been more than 40 years, but I have thought of that Passover ever since. I was just a girl then, only 12 years old, and now I tell this story to my own grandchildren as they gather for the Seder meal. We were not a wealthy family. Oi, my mother could squeeze a denarii until Caesar himself would cry for mercy. But there were still nights that we went to bed with empty stomachs. I had to work cleaning and cooking for families who had money and needed a girl with a strong back. Every day I was out running errands. I knew Jerusalem like the Pharisees knew the details of the law. Every little street and back alley and most of the people, definitely. And Passover, oy, such a busy time. So much cleaning, so much cooking, and always being sent to get things. It was also a time to be careful on the streets. The Romans, I spit on the Romans, were, how do you say, nervous? So many people in Jerusalem from out of town for the festival. So much commotion and an atmosphere of preparation and celebrations. The Romans, they occupied our country, but they knew that they could never occupy our hearts, especially on the most special night when we remember how God delivered our people in the past. Definitely the Romans were nervous. I was especially busy that day as my mother had a large group who had rented our upper room for their Seder. 
15 people, she said. I thought maybe a nice family, a grandparent and, and a little boy who would ask about why this night was so special, maybe a little girl my age. But no, my mother said 13 men. 13 men, I said. Why aren't they home with their wives and their children? A rabbi, she said, and 12 students. Oi, a rabbi and 12 of their students, even worse. Maybe they walk around all day with their heads full of Torah, but at the end of the day, their feet are just as stinky and smelly as everyone else's. So much bread we would need, so much wine. I hope they paid in advance. We managed to get everything ready by sunset. Not a lot of bread, but enough. Not a lot of wine, but enough. And I even had a tub with enough water to wash 26 dusty, smelly feet. And they came in talking and arguing. I tried to stay out of the way. There would be enough work that I would need to do later on. But the rabbi, the rabbi did the strangest thing. While the students were arguing and finding their place around the table, he took off his outer robe and, and he picked up that basin and that cloth that I had laid out with water to clean the feet. And he, the rabbi, started to wash his students' feet. It was the strangest thing. And a big man stood up, a, a big man, uh, and, he argue, and he argued with the rabbi. This big man, he was not from Jerusalem. He had a northern accent, from Galilee, I, I think. And the big man, he argued with the rabbi. He did not want the rabbi washing his feet, but the rabbi talked to him. And the rabbi said that he needed to wash his feet, and so the big man let him. Well, the meal was special as the Seder is always special. My mother's good food, remembering the Passover story and our deliverance, the hopes and the dreams of our people, even in the face of the Romans. At the end of the meal, the rabbi did an even stranger thing. He took a piece of bread and he tore it in two. And he said to all of his students who were sitting there, he said, this is my body, broken for you. When you eat it, remember me. And then he took the cup of wine and, and he poured it and he said, this is my blood given for you. When you drink of it, remember me. What could that mean? I know that the Seder is blood, but it's the blood of the Passover lamb. It's not human blood. And what body was broken? It made no sense to me at all. This was the strangest rabbi I have ever seen. And I tell you, I have seen a few. But as always, Passover has much to do. And there were a lot of tables to clean and dishes to wash and floors to clean. Not just for these men, but for the families that my mother cooked for outside and other places as well. I worked until very night, late that night. And it was cold and dark when I went home. And so I took the back streets, being very careful to avoid those Romans. There was often a fire in the courtyard of the high priest's house, and so I stopped to warm myself. And there was a group of people there doing the same thing, and, and they were standing around the fire, and they were talking, and they were arguing about politics, wondering if the Romans would punish us this year as we celebrate our Passover. And then I realized that they were talking about that rabbi, the rabbi who had just been eating my mother's food in our upper room with his friends. In fact, one of his friends was there, that big man who argued because he didn't want his feet to be washed. He wasn't saying anything, but he was there. And then a servant girl asked him, are you one of those who was with him? And that big man said, no, it wasn't me. And someone else said, weren't you with the Galilean? And the big man said, oh, I don't know what you're talking about, but I knew he was lying. I saw him there. I saw him eating with the rabbi in my house that night, and I recognized his northern accent. You are one of his friends, I said, and you have a Galilean accent. And he looked at the faces around the fire, and he said, I swear I do not know him. And then he stared at me. 
and suddenly I felt very cold. And then a rooster crowed. And the big man? He looked like someone had punched him in the stomach. But no one was near him. It was the strangest thing. And then he stood up and he turned and he walked away. And I turned and made my way home as the sun was rising. It was the strangest night. Definitely. Maybe you've heard the rest of the story. The Romans, they crucified that rabbi. It was just as he had said that night. His body was broken and his blood was given. Bread and wine, such ordinary things and yet so much meaning. And every Passover, I remember and I wonder, I wonder especially this year when the Romans have occupied our temple and destroyed our temple. And I wonder, how will we be delivered now? How can we survive when the things that we love the most are taken from us? They said that all of this man's friends left him, even the ones who ate with him that night. They all left him. And the Romans, they beat him. They beat that rabbi and they taunted him and they they spit on him and they nailed him to a cross And yet somehow he forgave them. He forgave his friends who ran away. Even that man that I saw across from the fire who pretended not to know him. He even forgave his enemies, the Romans, who killed him like a criminal. So much forgiveness, so much love to come out of that broken body and spilled blood. So now when I sit at the Seder meal with my grandchildren and wonder if there will be enough for us, I look at the bread and I look at the wine and I know that that rabbi, he had so much forgiveness, more than I can even imagine. And sometimes when I tell my grandchildren this story about how he forgave those who killed him, those who destroyed our temple, those who destroyed our hope, how he forgave the Romans, sometimes I even forget to spit.
Come, you who are weary and restless. Come, all who hunger and thirst. We are ready. Creating God, source of all our being and all the earth, we thank you and we praise you for the gift of life. We thank you for calling us to obedience and for sending us Jesus to show us how to live. Jesus, our Savior, we praise you for the glory of redemption. It was you who suffered the world's pain so that we may live. We celebrate the Holy Spirit, our sustainer, who carries us through life with the love and the strength of the Lord. And we join in your unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We gratefully recall and remember Christ's birth as one of us, Christ's baptism for our sin, Christ's compassion for our suffering, Christ's intimacy with our frailty, Christ bearing the cross with its death, and Christ rising from the tomb by the power of God. It was Jesus who took the bread, gave thanks and broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body, which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Whenever you drink of it, do it in remembrance of me. And so we affirm the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Now join with me with your hands over your bread and your wine or your juice. Put your hands over the elements like this and join your hearts with mine as we pray together. Consecrate, therefore, by your Holy Spirit these gifts of bread and wine. Bless us that as we receive them, we may offer you our faith and our praise. We may be united with Christ and with one another, and we may be strengthened by the Holy Spirit to continue faithfully as disciples in your world. And let us say the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Through this broken bread, we participate in the body of Christ. Through the cup of blessing, we participate in the newness of life. have not now, please be sure to take communion. And let us join together in prayer. We thank you, Lord, for your presence. Strengthen us in faith. Increase our love for one another. And let us show the world your greatness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, in unity with the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.
when it was evening, he took his place with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. And they became greatly distressed and began to say to him one after another, surely not I, Lord. He answered, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The son of man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that one by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. Judas, who betrayed him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. He replied, You have said so. Then Jesus said to them, You will all become deserters because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Though all become deserters because of you, I will never desert you. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all of the disciples. Was his custom to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. When he reached the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not come into the time of trial. Then he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, knelt down, and prayed, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. They went to a place called Shesenamine, and he said to his disciples, Stay here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John and began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, I am deeply grieved even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that, if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. He came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words, and once more he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to say to him. He came a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Enough! The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Go to darkness, Emily, ye that feel the tempter's power, your Redeemer's conflicts here, watch with him one bitter hour. Turn not from his griefs away, Jesus Christ to pray. Jesus had spoken these words. He looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. 
They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, so that they also may be sanctified in truth. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the wor world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one, as we are one. Tis midnight and on olive's brow, the star is dim that lately shone. Tis midnight in the good and now, the After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. Then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace, that is the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole cohort, and they clothed him in a purple cloak, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him, and they began saluting him, Hail, King of the Jews! They struck his head with a reed, spat upon him, and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. Oh.
Yeah.